The story of Virgin America as a startup just felt really untold. On the eve of Virgin America's 13th anniversary of its very first flight, I asked two former colleagues and now lifelong friends to join me to share the biggest takeaways from launching a brand new airline and growing it during two global financial crises in an industry that is seeing some pretty challenging times right now. Virgin America had since built a loyal following of flyers thanks to its moonlit cabins, fleet-wide Wi-Fi, innovative amenities like touchscreen personal entertainment, and power outlets. What I remember is a very innovative, tech-forward flying experience that reflected the Virgin brand values of giving people choice and control in an environment with little choice and control. I remember being so surprised and overwhelmed by the experience of seeing the aircraft, the interior of the aircraft for the first time, because it was truly like nothing else. And Richard got so emotional because he wasn't allowed to go inside the cabin until then. It was pretty remarkable how the attempts by the legacy carriers to impede innovation and competition on behalf of passengers made it so hard. Abby, you joined Virgin America in 2007 when it was actually not clear when and from where the first flight would take place. At the same time, you also had to start building brand awareness. When I joined, we actually didn't have approval to fly yet from the Department of Transportation or FAA. At that point, only Governor Schwarzenegger, who I was working for at the time, and then Mayor Newsom were supportive of Virgin launching. I was just so blown away by actually seeing the inside of the aircraft, which were really sort of unlike anything I had ever seen at that point. Adam and team just had done an amazing job with the design and sort of thoughtfulness. And I immediately was like, we just need to get people on, on the planes. We didn't have regulatory approval and we're burning through hundreds of millions of dollars because they're sitting on the tarmac, is that we could like get them and open them up to media <laughs> or friends. This was way back in 2007, get on the planes first and just check out the technology. A lot of people forget this because it's like, oh, they had such great press and, you know, fast companies, most innovative company and doing really great with the press. We had such terrible business press from the very beginning. The aviation analysts really had no belief that the airline would make any money. They sort of poo-pooed a lot of the, the design brand features as just things that people don't care about. No one will pay more money for this. So I think tactically we were like, let's just go to the people who are using the product and and we did our first Wi-Fi flight. And as Christine mentioned, a partnership with YouTube. We had YouTube influencers back in the day. We live streamed it to a YouTube event on the ground. Essentially for that Wi-Fi test flight, it was all sort of like the original cadre of like tech journalists. So it was like Brian Lamb and Jenny Jardan from Boing Boing and Glenn Fleischman from Ars Technica and folks like that, Peter Ha to give them a sneak peek of, of the Wi-Fi and let them test it themselves and do kind of, all kinds of geeky stuff to see if they could overload the system, which was hilarious. We really leaned into that because I think it gave us a direct line to our actual customers and people who were interested in the product, interested in the technology on board, interested in an airline that could try, or at least was trying to do things better and reinvent the industry. It gave us like a very tactical way around the at times very negative establishment business practice and eventually wore them down. So they think deep pockets and that we had huge advertising budgets and we really didn't. We were very tiny, especially compared to the other airlines. During the time that Virgin America grew, a lot of social media companies were starting to launch. Twitter launched in 2006, YouTube the year before, Facebook the year before that in 2004, Instagram started in 2010. You were not always looking for the biggest brands to partner with, but really like-minded, that like with shared purpose and shared values. We were the first airline to have fleet-wide Wi-Fi. We were the first to start actually delivering customer service on Twitter, <laughs> not over Wi-Fi, which my team led. It gave us kind of a direct platform and path to our customers. There was a lot of 
stress and figuring new things out that came from that. But overall, it was much more helpful for us in the long run and really helped build engagement with our customers and the brand over time, being able to get somebody a meal because they couldn't figure out how to use the onboard menu system or help them with a connecting flight over Twitter before they landed. The amount of like regulatory oversight and operational like finesse that is needed to do anything in the airline is is quite high as it should be. People sort of have like a jaded view of airlines and that, you know, employees like who works at airline kind of a little bit disparaging. And it's like, it's like the smartest people you'll ever meet. We're gonna do a tandem flight with the Virgin Galactic spaceship to open SFO. And like, we need special permission from the FAA and like our flight off <laughs> thought Bob Weatherly. Steve Fort, all of those guys who ran operations would just like laugh when we came to them. <laughs> that was the initial, the initial was laughter. And then they would figure out like, okay, how can we do it? And we would get very much pulled into that process of like, how do we sort of make the case to get all of these special permissions and show that we're doing it in a really buttoned up way, which we always were. That SFO flight was really interesting because we just had to get special permission. That was a brand new airport. We had everybody on board that plane flying in next to the, the Virgin Galactic spaceship and you could see them like we were coming in on the dual runways at SFO. If you guys are over on the right side, we do have the seatbelt sign on, but disregard it. Just a special today. Get on over to that left side. Do not miss this opportunity to see the future of space travel. Doesn't that look wonderful? I learned so much about operations and like how you could do these things in a better way for customers and for the operations to run smoothly. And when you look back at it over time, the industry has caught up. People realize that there is a market for these things, virgin sort of trailblazing that, that enables or sort of accelerates the adoption of these things by the supplying industry to make it accessible for everyone. I think it's kind of a positive thing about the risks that Virgin America took at the beginning. It's, it wasn't actually just Virgin America customers that benefited from that.